everybody here this morning. We'll uh, get back in our study over here in the book of Jude, and uh, we'll be picking up in Second uh, Peter 2. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the word, Lord, for the word of God. Give me the gift of teaching this morning and give the folks ears to hear. And we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, <clears throat> as I've told you before, the book of Jude is connected with the book of Revelation. And so is the book of uh, 2 Peter. And uh, these, uh, uh, these books are connected in a sense that they speak and will speak to the generation alive while these events are transpiring. The book of Revelation will open up for people who are here during the tribulation. The Bible will be here for people in the tribulation period. And the book of Revelation will open up for them. So many things that are simply too obscure or unknown to make a, a, a definitive statement about, and I hear men do it all the time, and I know they don't know what they're talking about. You cannot. Some of these things that, uh, that are going to happen in the tribulation period, there's no way you can know exactly until the time comes. So here in the book of Jude, <clears throat> he says, uh, Enoch, in verse 14, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. We talked about that last week at length, about how there is a book of Enoch that's called, it's an apocryphal book of Enoch. Uh, apocrypha means hidden. Uh, these books that, do not, uh, that were not included in the Scripture fall into about three or four different categories, but they're usually called apocrypha or pseudepigraphic. Pseudepigraphic means false writing. Apocryphal means hidden. Hidden. You have Christian apocryphal books, and you have Jewish apocryphal books, and you also have secular apocryphal books. And, uh, for example, the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, quatrains of Nostradamus. That's a an apocryphal book because his quatrains are written in a fashion to where they can be understood if you understand if you have the key or the code to unlock them. But otherwise, they cannot be understood. A lot of people put a lot of stock in Nostradamus. The problem with Nostradamus is that it is not inspired scripture. Just like Gene Dixon or any other prognosticator, it's not inspired scripture. They may hit it here and there occasionally, may, be, may hit the truth, may hit it right. But a true prophet of God will never miss. And that's how he said you'd know. So in the book of Jude, it talks about Enoch, the seventh from Adam. And Enoch, of course, we know was a historical character in the Bible that was uh, lifted up out of this world, who was caught up. Now, notice how he shows up here in the Bible, in the book of Jude. Enoch shows up in the Scriptures. Now, if you'll remember, the Lord said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The Bible associates, associates certain people with certain time periods or events uses that person in the Old Testament as a type of what happens to someone in the New Testament. Now, Enoch is probably one of the clearest types in the Old Testament of what happens to someone in the New Testament. And I've heard, I'm sure you've heard it preached thousands of times that Enoch is a type of the church or the bride of Christ, for he's caught up just before the judgment of God comes down upon the earth. He's caught up. He's caught up to be with the Lord. And the Bible says he was caught up that he should not see death. So Enoch, therefore, becomes a type of the church. Now, notice it says here in the book of Jude that Enoch prophesied. So we find Enoch preaching, and we know that Enoch lived uh, after he, be he was, how old was he last week when he begat Methuselah? How old was he? Sixty-five years old. How long did he live after he begat, begat Methuselah? Three hundred years. All right. And the Bible says he prophesied. Okay, so that meant that for 300 years, possibly, we don't know for certain because we don't know when the prophecy came, but for 300 years probably, Enoch prophesied of the coming of the Lord. How do we know that? You remember what the name Methuselah means? That when, he is, when he is dead or when he is gone, it will be sent. That's what Methuselah means. And Methuselah was the oldest man that ever lived in the Bible, that, uh, that, that Scripture records his age. He would live to be 969 years. All right, so when he is dead, it will be sent. Or when he is, when he is gone, it will, it will come. Anywhere in that general area, uh, meaning that when Methuselah's out of here, something's coming in, something's coming in. 
And of course, what was he referring to when he said when he is dead? The flood of Noah. And the flood of Noah was a universal flood. Yep. It covered the entire earth from, wow. from uh, pole to pole. Yep. Not, a, not a bit of uh, ground was uh, left uh, above the earth, above the waters. All right, now. So Enoch therefore prophesied and he preached and he preached of the coming of the Lord. Notice it says what he preached here in the book of Jude, verse number 14. He prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. All right, refer to these. What's the antecedent of these? What are we going back to? What are we referring to? What's subject matter? Notice it says in verses uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12, we're talking about people who had refused the truth, rejected the truth. Verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So Enoch prophesied of these and said, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. In other words, men pleasers. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Be, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now let's stop here for a moment because what follows is uh, some heavy-duty scripture. Now if you'll notice up until this point, he kind of gives a general, uh, general uh, description of the kind of people who are rejecting the truth. Tells you what kind reject the truth. Now, these people are mockers. They mock and make fun of the truth. In the time of Enoch in his day, the Scripture says that he prophesied of these and preached about these. Now, what coming is he talking about, do you think? In verse 14, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. When Enoch preached this, go back now to a time when he's preaching. How far back are we looking? We're looking a long way back. When the time of Enoch was a long way back, we're looking at least 1,000, approximately 1,000 years before the flood because Methuselah lived 969 years, see? And he begat Methuselah, therefore he began to preach. So you're looking at a generally 1,000 years before the flood. All right? And Archbishop Usher places the flood somewhere about, uh, about uh, 2,400 years after the creation. Somewhere along in there. So you're looking back from the time of the creation of Adam to the time of uh, where we stand today. We're looking at 6,000 years approximately from the creation of Adam to where we are now. See, And this seventh millennium will finish up the 7,000th year of perfection, completion with God. Now, if we, have, if we are at the 6,000th year and, uh, and say, for example, that... Uh, Job lived uh, approximately 2,000 B.C., which was 4,000 years ago, then we're looking at uh, almost 5,000 years ago. Enoch's preaching. And what's he preaching about? Second Advent. That's quite a thing. To put it in chronological perspective kind of gives you an idea of the span of the Bible. Here we are before the flood talking about the second coming. He hadn't even come the first time. Now, you see how the Bible is a book of ages? Yes, it's the book of ages. It literally is. And you, and you make a great mistake of taking the Bible and just trying to chop it all up and make everything cram or ram everything into this time period which you're living in right now. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Amen. But Enoch, the Bible said, the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly, so forth and so on. So we already have, before the first flood, before the flood of Noah, before the first universal judgment, we already have a prophecy given forth about the second advent. Now, when was the prophecy given forth about the first advent? 315. 
the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. That was a prophecy of the first advent in a kind of an obscure way because it simply refers to the fact that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. Now, the Old Testament builds on that seed, builds on that doctrine of the seed, and more comes out about the seed. And you can see that, uh, for example, Isaiah talks about him being a, a, a tender root out of dry ground. And uh, you see the Old Testament build on that doctrine of the seed, for you see that's the way the Bible is understood. The Bible reveals progressively through the ages certain truths and doctrines and here we are today looking back in retrospect where they were looking forward and they were looking through a glass darkly. And see, this is why the apostle says, we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now, if he prophesied of these and said this is the way it would be, that's quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? How do you think it was in the day of Noah before the flood? Do you suppose it was anything like it is today? It certainly was. So then, what has man learned? <coughs> exactly. He's learned absolutely nothing. He hadn't learned a thing. He hadn't learned a thing. Nothing. So, I could jump on that one and we could take off a long way. I want you to turn to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2, verse 1. 2 Peter, rather, chapter 2 and verse 1. In 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 1. Now let's notice how Peter and Jude connect themselves. Notice the connection. Look for connections. Look for little things dropped here and there that connect things together. One will give a little different perspective about the same event, same person, but they're connected. In 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 1, there were false prophets. Okay? Pseudo, pseudo prophetes, pseudo, false also among the people, even as there, as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Mr. Calvin, note carefully right here. He bought them. He didn't die just for the elect. He died for every man. So they deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, that's called G-R-E-E-D. If you want to see the capital of G-R-E-E-D, it is located in New York City on a particular street. It's called Wall. <laughs> well, go down Wall Street and you'll find a big American flag over a building. Inside that building, Commerce and greed like you haven't seen like I have never seen can't imagine the greed Warren Buffett said just the other day he was the richest man in the country now he and Bill Gates uh, uh, you know jockey for the position uh, poor old Bill's lost a few billion he's only worth about 40, 55 or 60 billion now and Mr. Gates has uh, I mean Mr. Buffett has surpassed him and here was, here's his latest word here's his latest word to the American public and the stock market. Uh, I looked at sun a Saturday's paper and I noticed General Motors and uh, General Electric and looked at some of these huge companies and their stock had dropped something like, uh, for example, General Motors, uh, say a year ago. It'll give you a list if you know how to read that list. It'll say year to date and it'll say what it was a year ago, how much it's fallen, the percentage and so forth. Uh, General Motors was worth something like 55 or 60 bucks a share. Now it's worth $4 and a half five bucks, something of that nature. I may be off a little bit, but it's something, you know, you can see a tremendous drop in the value of the stock. And uh, here's what Mr. Buffett says. He says, buy now. He says, buy now. He says, everybody needs some greed. Buy now. In plain words, buy General Motors stock at four dollars and a half because the government will bail them out. And when the government, you will, of course. And when the, the government has no money. They either print it fiat money or they tax you. Get ready to be taxed, by the way. And they bail them out. When they bail them out, then the stock of price of value of stock will shoot up to 45, 50 bucks, may even climb higher with a, uh, which one is it, bear, bull? Bull market's the one that's growing. Bear market's the one that's falling. So the bull's about to enter in and it start to grow. G-R-E-E-D. So first thing tomorrow morning, call your broker and and uh, tell him, put 300000 down on GM and uh, 
save five or six hundred thousand down on uh, GE. And uh, on and on and on it goes. You see, there are people that that's how they live. Day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. What does the Bible say about money? Make sure you get it right. Now here, it is very important. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. And you can see what is produced up there. And we will pay for that for the next thousand years. Ten trillion dollars, this nation is in debt. That's ten thousand billion. That's a lot of money. This nation is in debt. And depending on who goes in as president, will determine how much quicker or how much further in debt we go. Amen. And how much this nation will uh, be ready for the Antichrist. Amen. That's all I can say for this nation. I can say that this nation stands on the brink right now of, uh, of entering into a one-world government, a one-world financial system, just like all the other nations. The President of France said yesterday with the President of the United States standing next to him, yep. the President of France said, we need a one-world government. We need to come out of this with a one-world government. We need to learn our lessons through this financial system. The only way to prop up the financial system is for there to be one currency controlled all over the world. The buying and selling, therefore, is standardized with one currency. You see the you can see the benefits of it. How many see the benefits of one currency? It's a good thing. How many see the benefits of an antichrist? I mean, if you want the world to operate efficiently, the antichrist will do the job. Because the Bible says in the book of Daniel that everything will prosper under his hand. So, I mean, it's a good thing. And if it's a good thing, it's got to be of God. That's the kind of stuff they've been pumped into their minds now for years. If it's good, it's got to be of God. The problem is it's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, anyway, let's get back over here. Many shall follow their ways. From covetousness shall they feigned words make merchandise of you. My goodness gracious. Peter said that 2,000 years ago. You ought to put a billboard here in town instead of saying, uh, instead of a big black billboard that says, uh, Hi, I'm God. Why don't you just put that up there? Right, right. Put that up there. Yeah. That's got power in it. Yep. That's got power. That said something right there. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved to judgment, spared not the old world, saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. The number of eight, therefore, becomes the number established in Scripture of new beginning because Noah was the one who began a new world, repopulated a new world, the eighth person. Notice that uh, over here in uh, Jude, what is Enoch called? Verse 14. See? <clears throat> to talk about these numbers like this is not an arbitrary thing. Right. You're not forcing it. You're not making it happen. The Bible says it plainly. He, Enoch was the seventh from Adam, therefore he prophesied of the finish of it. Noah was the eighth, and he went over into the new world. See that? And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost comprise the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The number three, therefore, becomes the number of unity. Not two. Three. Three and one. See, three becomes a number of unity. Ten's a number of uh, forty. For example, in the Bible, is the number of of, uh, of uh, trials, testing. Forty years they wandered the wilderness. Forty days the Lord was tempted or tried of Satan. See, and these numbers are important. <laughs> Ten in the Bible's number of nations or Gentiles or the Goyim, as the Jew refers to them. So he spared not the old world, and cast them into chains of darkness to be reserved to judgment. Spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The, lo the Lord knoweth how to deliver, the to deliver the godly out of temptations reserved the ungodly the day of judgment. Now, what's the connection? All right, look, 
back to the book of Jude. We have Enoch before the flood. We have Noah before the flood. Go back to the book of Jude. We have the preaching. We have, the, we have uh, in verse number 11, the book of Jude, we've got Cain and Balaam. All right. When you go over here to the book of Second Peter, look at verse number 15, chapter number 2. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam. So what you have in chapter number 2 of Second Peter 2, you have the progeny of Cain. These are, the peop these are the descendants of Cain that were the covetous, so forth and so on. Cain is in Second Peter, just like he is in Jude. Balaam is in Second Peter, just like he is in Jude. And then what's the third one we have? Over here in the book of Jude, we have Korah. And what did Korah do? He certainly did. He, he, he went against the authority of Moses, all right? And that's exactly what you'll find over here in the book of Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter number 2. Notice what it says on further. Second Peter, chapter number 2. And uh, verse number 12. But these as natural brute beast made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, why am I doing all of this? Let me tell you why. Go back to the book of Jude, and now let's go to verse number 23, verse 22, the book of Jude. Verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Did you get that? And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, both now and forever. Amen. What's he talking about? What's he talking about of others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire? Now, do you see, first of all, can you sense urgency? Can you sense a climactic thing? The end of the end. Can you sense that uh, Peter and Jude are definitely talking about the same time period? Because they're talking about the same people, the same events, comparing them in the Old Testament with what happens in the New. Yes, they are. So what's going on here? We are talking about something that's happening right at the end of the end. We're talking about people that are so close to the very judgment of God, second coming, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, that they are literally pulled out of the fire, hating the garments spotted by the flesh. How far would you go? Where would that go to? You remember what I told you at the beginning of the lesson today? That certain portions of the Bible are written to Old Testament Jews. Certain portions of the Bible are written to people or written about people who lived before the Bible was ever written. Certain portions of the Bible are written to Gentiles before Christ came. Certain portions of the Bible are written to people alive during the very time of the apostles. Certain portions of the Bible are written to the early New Testament church first century after Christ. Certain portions of the Bible are written universally in the sense that they're called Catholic epistles. And I don't like that word, but it, uh, in the sense they think, well, you mean it belongs to the Catholic Church? No, the word Catholic means a universal epistle. That's what it means. In other words, it means to be, it's not necessarily addressed to the church of Thessalonica and so forth. All churches can read it. Everybody can read it. That's why it's called a Catholic epistle. So it's addressed to all believers everywhere. Certain portions of the Bible are addressed, are addressed directly to members of certain churches. Certain portions of the Bible, for example, in the book of Revelation, are addressed to specific problems in specific churches. Then there are portions in the Bible that are addressed to people living in an age that you're not living in, in a time period that you're not living in. And the book of, Re the book of Jude, if you'll notice carefully, look at that text. 
It says that you could even pull them out of the fire and make a difference. Now, who do you think he's talking to? Do you think he's talking to church age people or do you think he's talking to tribulation people? It would seem to me that the application would be more for somebody in the tribulation period itself. You see, the Bible writes like this. That man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, all right? And there will come a falling away first before that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Let no man deceive you by word or by letters from us that the day of Christ is at hand. For the day of Christ shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of right. sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Not the day of the Lord. The new Bibles all mess it up. Right. Day of Christ. So what you do, if here's the first thing that a police officer will do. And it, here's a detective. A detective will do this. He will get a timeline. And we need to be, do some detective work in the Bible. Let's get us a timeline, a chronology, all right? Lay a timeline out and say, where does this fit? I mean, we don't deny the Bible. We believe the Bible. Right. But where does it fit? Where does it fit in the timeline? All right, here's one of the things that we know that fits. What is the day of Christ? Is it the same as the day of the Lord? Is there a difference between the two of them? If you remember that the day of Christ, and this will help you understand the Bible, the day of Christ has to do with Christ and His bride. The day of the Lord has to do with God and His judgment on the earth. See, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a subject in the Old Testament over and over and over and over and over, over again. It talks about the coming of the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Therefore, the day of Christ that the apostle mentions in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 has to do with the bride, and that's who he's talking to. He says, don't let any man deceive you, the bride of Christ, for that day shall not come. What day? The day of Christ. Well, what is the day of Christ? Well, the day of Christ has to do with Christ and his bride, and the day of Christ has to do with Christ and his bride when he comes to get his bride. When he comes to take his bride and set her down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, then when he and when he takes his bride and he comes back with his bride. That's the day of Christ. That's the day of Christ. It's the day of Christ and his bride. They're not the same as the day of the Lord. So in Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, in our timeline, we'll put the day of Christ right here. We'll start at that point. And at that point, the day of Christ, I know this, I know this much about what the Bible says. It says that we will see the man of sin, the son of perdition, revealed. That's what it says. That's what it says. And if you've made it the day of the Lord, you've got the church in the tribulation, see. You get into all kinds of problems, but it's the day of Christ. Christos in your Bible, not Kyrios. Kyrios is Lord, Christos is Christ. So we start with our timeline, and here's the day of Christ, and we know that the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. All right, we've got that one nailed down. We know that's going to happen. We can expect to look for his his uh, revelation, manifestation, for him to be, for us to, we're not children of the night or of darkness. We know enough about the Antichrist to know that when he does begin to take power, we can see enough about him to say, that's got to be the man. If that's not the man, Satan's grooming him to be the man. Do you believe the devil knows the future? <laughs> you believe the devil knows the future? Be careful you don't uh, 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 be, devil, be, be careful you don't give the devil divine attributes. Do you believe the devil can read the Bible? He, he quoted the scripture, quoted Christ. He offered him the kingdom of this world, so forth and so on. Sure, he can read about the Antichrist. He can read the Book of Revelation. He can read all of that. Satan is no fool. He can read the Bible. He can read all of that. He knows what's coming. Now, therefore, in every generation, I believe he grooms his man. Because nobody knows who this son of perdition is going to be. That would mean that Satan can look down generations into time, into the future, into a thousand generations into the future and say, he'll be born on September such and such in the year 1932 and come of age in such and such and he will be, he will be an Italian born in, in Palermo, Italy and he'll come to power in such and such a time and there he is, there's your man. No, he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that. But he's always been around. And he has his candidate in every generation. And he grooms him. 
And he's grooming some right now, folks. Make no mistake about it. Mark it down in your book and just watch and watch well. And so when he grooms his man, he grooms his man. He offers that man power that can only come from a spirit being with a power he's got. That man sells his soul to Satan. You've read the classic uh, book about Faustus. He sells his soul to Satan. And he sells his soul to Satan for power and wealth. And he sells his soul to Satan in this temporal world. And when he sells his soul to Satan, Satan empowers him with all kinds of ability. He gives him what he needs. And that power that he gives him comes from the devil. That's why it says in Revelation 13, the beast had his power from the dragon. The dragon gave him his power, seed, authority, and all that. All right. So what you need to watch for is one who begins to rise up in the, in the sight of the world. And that man has, has intellect above and he has a charisma that surpasses. And he has ability. And better watch for him. And he grooms them. And I'm not so sure that Satan always leaves just one candidate. I don't think he puts all his eggs in one basket. He has a backup. Yeah. He has a backup. And uh, he's ready if something... If, he has contingency plans, in other words. So... Uh, you're going to see that. Watch for it. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Look for the leadership of this world. Look for people who say, uh, take note when somebody says, uh, I'm going to change the world. Take note of it. Just take note of it. When they say, I'm going to change the world, you say to yourself, uh oh, it's no longer about... Uh, just a country it's about the world have you noticed all of the focus is on the world now have you noticed the monetary listen folks there's not a not a speck of doubt in my mind that all this that happened in the stock market was 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 designed to create the need of a one world currency and it's going to do it's going to come it's going to come sure as you hear me and the one world currency, of course, puts the, puts the power of, uh, of uh, buying and selling into the hands of a select few. And uh, it's going to come. It's going to come. So uh, I marvel at how quickly things are happening now. Okay? And the very things we're talking about right now, right now are the things that you should be looking for according to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. You're not a child of the darkness, child of the night, you're a child of the day. This day should not overtake you unawares. This is the beginning point. The beginning point is we'll know the man of sin when he steps on the stage of time. And who is he? I don't know who he is. But I know Satan can be grooming certain individuals. And once they become that, they become it. And so... Uh, be careful. All right, now what happens? Well, when this man of sin is revealed, it's not long after that that he comes back in this, in this, in this hidden, this uh, mysterious thing that's called the rapture. And we don't know exactly how long, but we do have some clues. Okay? We have some clues. One clue is that the man of sin is going to sign a covenant, a covenant of peace. And he's going to have a covenant of peace and he's going, to, he's going to sign some kind of a covenant with Israel. And God says in the Old Testament, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to annul your covenant with death and hell. He never would have let him sign a covenant with anybody. God always got angry when Israel turned to any nation for its, for its protection. So the signing of a covenant means that the time clock begins to tick. The tribulation period runs seven years. And yet it is cut short. And that's one of those mysterious things. A lot of folks have racked their brains trying to figure out exactly how long the tribulation is. Because if you get in the book of Daniel, start reading over there, it talks about so many thousands of days and cut off here and this and that. The Lord said, except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be left alive. So though it runs seven years, God whacks it off. He cuts it off and allows it to get to the point of no return. Right before it gets there, He whacks it off. So... Seven years begin to tick, all right? There is no scripture anywhere that can give us the time between when the church is raptured and when the seven years begin. Nowhere. We don't know. See? We don't know. That's one of those mysteries. It could be 
that you watch on TV. A peace table. And the man of sin sits down at that peace table and signs a covenant with Israel. And before the ink is dry, you're gone. <laughs> because you are not going into the tribulation. And the signing of that peace agreement is what starts the tribulation. Not the rapture. The rapture does not start it. The signing of that covenant with Israel and the Antichrist. And for seven years it ticks. So we, let's get our timeline. Here's the revelation of the man of sin. Somewhere between the revelation of the man of sin and the signing of a peace agreement with Israel. Somewhere. Month, year, two years, three years. I don't know. There's no, there's no, you can't nail it down anywhere. It's probably no more than probably six months. Year. But who knows? But once that happens, once that happens, then it starts ticking away at the very moment that that's signed. So let's say, for example, just, just for uh, example's sake, <laughs> here's the church. Here we are having prayer meetings night and day because we know who he is. And we're trying to warn people. We're trying to tell them. We're saying, look. Look what the Bible says. Look what he's doing. Look what the Bible says. Look at his policies. Look what the Bible says. Look at the monetary system of the world. Look at the Bible. Look at the World Bank. Look what the Bible says. Look at all these nations come together. And you're trying to warn people because you know it's looking, you're looking at eyeball to eyeball. You see it every day of your life. You're no fool. You know the world is ripe for the Antichrist. And here's the man that fits the bill. That's what you're telling people, see. You're trying to warn people. You're trying to get them ready. And you're getting them ready. Because right here may be Jude. Others make a difference. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating the garments spotted by the flesh. There's one thing that happens in the tribulation period that kind of uh, is... is, is uh, in, I, think it's in, I think it's in Revelation 16. It says that something comes up on the skin of the, of the people who uh, worship the beast... You remember what it was? Boils. Boils. See? Boils come up on their skin. All right? If you have a garment over the top of a boil, what have you got? You got a mess. You, you got a mess. Okay? You got a mess. All right? When the tribulation period begins, Revelation chapter number 6, if you've ever read it carefully, you'll notice that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, general perspective of the whole tribulation just in one chapter, sixth chapter of Revelation. It's a general perspective of the whole thing. And so you have to be careful studying Revelation because everything's not laid out chronologically and chapter that follows chapter doesn't necessarily mean chronologically it follows in time. It could be that a chapter that follows a chapter really chronologically precedes that chapter. Is that fully confusing? In the tribulation period, people will break out with boils, sores, all kinds of hideous things are coming on their flesh. That would kind of make a connection there with hating the garment spotted by the flesh. It'd give it more meaning, wouldn't it? In plain words, here you are. You know, nothing just starts like that. Okay? Nothing. Just, wars don't start just like that. Never has happened. A lot of things uh, lead up to war. So the tribulation, the tribulation period kind of evolves. I hate to really use the word evolve. That's not a good word. <laughs> Preacher believes in evolution. They'll go out and tell people. Of course, evolve is a good word, but you know, I don't believe in biological evolution. You know that. But it just kind of comes about. Through all the circumstances, everything's coming together at the same time. See? That's the key to look for. It comes together at the same time. Don't you think it's quite a remarkable thing? I mean, have you really thought about this? That in just November the 4th, just a few weeks from now, we are going to elect a president of the United States of America and the stock market goes belly up? Yeah. The worst stock market crash since 1929? Have you thought about that? It'd almost make you think it was by design, wouldn't you? It really would. I mean, why would the, why would the chairman, the CEO of Lehman Brothers, 
look into the camera, and I don't know if you saw that photograph of him, but his head was down like this and his eyes were peering right into the camera. And he said, why didn't you save us? You saved uh, AIG. Did they say Wamu? Yeah, Morgan, Morgan Stanley. Why didn't you save us? In other words, here's, here, here's, here, this demands the question, who's pulling the strings? Who's deciding who saves who when? Okay? That's what this very smart man said when he looked into that camera and he said, how come we didn't get saved? Who's controlling this? That's the idea. Makes you wonder. Doesn't it? It makes you wonder why we have a financial collapse right before a presidential election. Why didn't, why, why, why didn't the financial collapse happen in March next year? <clears throat> is that an acronym? Oh, okay. MRSA, MRSA. Okay. And it's a staph infection. It's a type of staph infection. And it's resistant to these drugs. Are they saying then that the staph, uh, the staph has begun to mutate and becoming... Uh, and in that course of mutations becoming uh, resistant yeah. to In other words, immune system compromised or something of that nature, and then that makes you more susceptible to it. And it's a staph and staph type. And I know people have died from staph infections. And uh, your sister had that. She's got it now. All right. Is this one of these things that the news media doesn't uh, report because it doesn't want panic, but everybody knows about it because they've had people in the hospital and and work and. But now you say she has this MRSA. What's it? MRSA. MRSA, you don't have a vowel. Okay, MRSA, MRSA. And uh, did she go to the hospital with this, or did she get it while she was in there? She, uh, they, did, they put the shot in her brain in uh, Oak Ridge, and the doctor left the Oak Ridge Hospital and Memorial Hospital. Okay. And the doctor left So she picked it up in the hospital in Oak Ridge. And the Oak catheter got infected with it. So okay. Okay, she got it in the hospital. She had free brain surgery in two months. Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. Most of the people who come in contact with this, um, predominantly is a claim for a spider bite. The doctors have found that it's mysterious that these people never see a spider. So when you ask them what kind of spider, they can't identify because they never saw the spider. But a 33-year-old man, perfectly healthy, active, uh, playing soccer, married, never had no health issues, had a mark on his back where it came up, where he had contacted it. And he was dead in three days from this MRSA? Because it got into his system, got into his heart, his lungs, and just okay. takes over. Well, they wouldn't tell me that she got it in, in the hospital. Well, that's liability, see. But she, she didn't have it when she went to put the surgery. It is hospital-acquired, but there's a CMRSA that's community-acquired. But just CMRSA, it's on 
It's contagious. It's contagious. I wonder why all this is happening in California. Schwarzenegger is about to close his state down. He can't run it. doesn't have enough money. He can't run California. You know, it takes money to run a government. And, and So it sounds like since we came out with all these wonder drugs about 40, 50 years ago that uh, it's taken this much time for these things to begin to mutate and now they're coming back and they're coming back stronger than ever and there's not much they can do about it. Plague. The black plague's back. I, I read about that. In California? <laughs> Did anybody hear from California? We don't make you mad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. They can't get it out of the bloodstream, can they? It may go dormant a little while. And... Okay. Bottom line is it's incurable. We haven't always carried it, though, right? This is this is a relatively new thing where people are carrying this on their on their skin. Most people carry staff on their skin or in their hairs, but not most. Uh huh. Uh huh. Here's what I'm here's what I'm shooting at. I know we got to close and let these people go, but uh, I always have a tendency to get in. But uh, I just wonder if uh, if it's possible that that uh, we are infected and have been for a long time, don't know it, and that, uh, that it's, a, it's a sort of a thing that uh, that will eventually come. When it does come out, it will come out big time. And uh, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. All right, we'll pick it up next week and come to a close. Father, thank you for your word, Lord, for your sweet Holy Spirit. God, we pray you'd be with us in a few minutes. We preach the word and come together in your name before thee. In thy name we pray. Amen.